So my name is Shashank and uh, I'm one of the founding members of Cure. I lead neuro health at Cure. My I work on AI for neuro imaging. Uh, create I create platforms for show care management and finally look at different use cases for technology. So today I am honored to introduce Dr. Ajit Thomas, uh, a world leading expert in neurosurgery. He is professor at Harvard Medical School and uh, Beth Israel Dignes Medical Center. He is also co-director of uh, Brain Aneurysm Institute. His interests range from neurosurgery for uh, for stroke to aneurysms to hydrocephalus. Uh, he is moving to Cooper Neurological Institute as chairman of neurosurgery and will work with other key opinion leaders like Tudor Jovin. I'll leave the podium for uh, Dr. Rajit Thomas to uh, uh, explain about updates in endovascular uh, thrombo uh, therapy for stroke. Right? Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Rajit Thomas, for taking your time off. It's a great pleasure to talk to you about updates in endovascular therapy of stroke. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, we all know that stroke is an emergency. And why is it an emergency? Because when you have a large vessel that's occluded in a stroke, in a second you lose about 32,000 neurons. And in a, in a second, you lose 230 million synapses and you age about nine hours. And if, if that vessel stays occluded for an hour, then you can see you, you lose about 120 million neurons, you lose 830 billion synapses and you age about four years. So there is a sense of urgency when you have a stroke. And what happens is with the stroke, you get an area in the center, which you call an infarcted area, and this is beyond recovery. But around that area, there is what you call an ischemic penumbra. And then this white area is a normal brain. If you don't reperfuse the brain, and if you don't open up the artery, then the score infarct eventually fills that ischemic penumbra and it even gets bigger. So you end up with this kind of a scenario. But if you reopen the artery, then the infarct stays the same and you don't lose any additional brain tissue. So the major goal of an acute stroke management is resuscitation of the penumbral tissue. If you can resuscitate it quickly, the neurons recover and the patient improves. And if you don't reperfuse it, then there is this cascade that converts those ailing neurons in the penumbra to dead neurons and permanent infarction in that region. So this is another way to look at it. This is the brain. This black area denotes the area that's already infarcted, and then you have the ischemic penumbra around it. So when I see a patient in the emergency room, the questions I ask are, is this a stroke or a TIA, or is this some kind of non-stroke kind of uh, presentation? Where is the stroke? What kind is it? Is it a hemorrhage or is it an ischemic stroke? What is the most likely mechanism? Is the patient a candidate for thrombolysis or endovascular intervention? Now, when you look at the types of strokes, broadly speaking, 85% are ischemic. In other words, there is a decreased supply of blood to that area of the brain, and about 15% is hemorrhagic. And we are mainly going to talk about the ischemic stroke, and you can see that about 35% are pure large vessel occlusions um, without a cardioembolic cause, and cardioembolic is another 25%. Now, a lot of these cardioembolic strokes also end up with large vessel occlusion. So we are primarily concerned about the, the, these two groups when we talk about treatment of uh, or endovascular treatment of strokes. So the steps in management, first is to stabilize the vital signs. And the second question is, second uh, part of the management is, I ask three questions. Is there a large vessel occlusion? 
what is the extent of infarct? How much brain is at risk for further infarction? Now, the reason we ask these questions is because the, if the infarct is large and you reperfuse the brain, there is some risk of hemorrhage. And if there is a lot of brain at risk for further infarction, then it's worth taking the risk of reperfusion injury. The third step is imaging. You could use just a CT scan, which is plain, a CTA with perfusion, or an MRI with diffusion perfusion. Most centers use a combination of a CT scan and a CTA. And then once you do that, these are the potential interventional opportunities. One is medical management uh, and not any treatment. You know, sec you, you provide secondary stroke prevention. The other would be IV TPA, uh, which is a standard of care. And the third is endovascular clot removal. Now, you can also give IV TPA and go on to endovascular thrombectomy. That would be called bridging therapy. So why interventional treatment compared to IV TPA or an IV thrombolysis? I just want to show you a, a, a study which is done with IV TPA. Um, so the NINS TPA trial was done in the um, 80s, and you know that caused a significant paradigm shift in the treatment of acute stroke. This is ECAS, which was done much later, which extended the time window to 4.5 hours. But if you look at the data of the 403 patients, 55% of the patients in the placebo group had severe disability or death. In the treatment group, 48% had similar scores. So 7% of the patients had benefit from intervention with IV thrombolysis. In other words, 93% had no benefit, yielding a number needed to treat of 14. So uh, only a small fraction of patients actually benefit from the IV TPA. So we needed some other intervention. The other issue is we know that opening up the arteries result in a better outcome. So this is an example of patients uh, who had a large vessel occlusion. So if you had a large vessel occlusion and the artery was reopened, uh, you can see they had a good outcome in 58%. Whereas if it was non-revascularized, the outcome was bad. Uh, similarly, uh, you can see the 90-day mortality when they're non-revascularized, the, uh, the mortality is pretty high compared to the patients who had their arteries reopened. The other interesting fact is when you give IV TPA, overall, about 31% 31, 31 of the blood vessels that are occluded reopen. But if you look at large vessels like the ICA or MCA, only a much smaller fraction reopen. So IV TPA is not really that great for opening up the large vessels uh, that are occluded. And then there's also the impact of thrombus or clot burden. So if your thrombus is about uh, one to two millimeters in length, then IV TPA has a much higher rate of uh, recanalization. But when you get to the when you get to say a centimeter of thrombus, you can see the recanalization rate or the probability of recanalization drops precipitously. And what is the mortality with the large vessel occlusion? So as I said earlier, about 35 to 40 percent of ischemic strokes are large vessel, which is an internal cord artery, the middle cerebral artery, or the vertebral basilar artery. And if your ICA is occluded, your mortality rate is 53% without recanalization. If the MCA is occluded, it's about 27%. And if the basal artery is occluded, it's very high, at the risk of dying from it, 89 to 90%. So the goal of ischemic stroke treatment is opening up the arteries. So this is an MCA, which is occluded here. And you can see with thrombectomy, we have reopened the arteries. And this is a thrombus that we removed. And you can see how there is timely reperfusion. And that's the goal. And we have a 
we have a score with which we assess this. It's called the TIKI score, thrombolysis in cerebral in, uh, infarction score. Zero is no perfusion. 2B is perfusion of half or greater of the vascular distribution of the occluded artery. And three is full perfusion with uh, filling of all distal branches. So the thrombolysis and cerebral, uh, um, uh, cerebral infarction score, we want to get to 2B or three. That's our target. Uh, I mean, three would be ideal, but sometimes we only get up to 2B, which is also acceptable. And uh, another thing we have to be aware of is something called the Alberta Stroke uh, Score. It's called the Aspect Score. Now, this was a scale that was developed to detect early ischemic changes within three hours following acute ischemic stroke in the anterior circulation. It avoids the need for volumetric assessment and just uses 2D imaging. It helps identify patients in whom intervention is useful. And basically it has 10 points and we subtract one point for each ischemic change detected in a, in a region. So you can see how the CT scan is divided into 10 segments. This is all MCA territory. And then, for example, if this area is infarcted, you subtract one, so that would be nine, and this would be eight. So generally you want an aspect score uh, greater than six for any intervention. Um, and so we go on to mechanical thrombectomy, which is what I'm primarily interested in talking to you about. So the first device on the market was Mercy, then you had Penumbra and Solitaire, and then Trevo, Embotrap, and then just aspiration catheters. So this was the first device, Mercy. It was a tapered nitinol wire, which was um, like a helix. And the way we did the intervention was you would pass this Mercy retriever beyond the thrombus, and then uh, you'd have a base catheter here. Uh, this is a balloon inflated, and you would just um, bring this um, thrombus along with the Mercy retriever back into the base catheter and finally take it out of the body. The next was something called a penumbra system, where you had an uh, obturator and a base catheter, and you would keep passing the obturator up and down, and then the thrombus would just get sucked into this. But the turning point was the era of stent retrievers. A stent retriever basically is a stent that you can retrieve. So here is a picture of a stent, and this is the thrombus. You have the thrombus within the stent, and you aspirate it, and it's coming back into the base catheter. So uh, this was the solitaire was the first on the market, and then we had Trevo, subsequently Embotrap, and now there are multiple devices. Another technique is just to use an aspiration catheter, a technique called ADAPT, where you have a large bore aspiration catheter, which you thread over a smaller catheter all the way up into the thrombus, and then you just aspirate the thrombus. Uh, here is another technique where you use something called the Solumbra device, and you can have a uh, base catheter here, and you inflate the balloon, and you'll see that we deploy the stand retriever, and you uh, and you pull it back into the base catheter, and then you uh, you. Uh, you put it back into the base catheter and then you aspirate uh, the whole thing out. So this is how it looks. You have the thrombus within the stent retriever and along with the base catheter. So I just want to give you an example. This is a 59-year-old male who presented with sudden onset left hemiplegia while running a marathon. And you can see how his internal cord artery, this is a CTA, is occluded as it enters the brain. And you have the middle cerebral artery on the right side, and you have the anterior cerebral artery here, and you can see that there is no filling of this area. 
And so the patient went for a CT perfusion. And what you see on the MTT, or the mean transit time, is there's a large area of uh, ischemic brain. So the MTT uh, diagnoses the area of the ischemic brain. And then you had something called cerebral blood volume, which is also part of the CT perfusion, which shows that a significant amount of brain is already infarcted. This is a dark blue area. But if you look at the area at risk and the area that's infarcted, this patient is a reasonable candidate for thrombectomy. And so you can see that this is from the left internal cord artery, DSA, which shows that there's no flow into the right hemisphere. And when you did the internal cord run on the right side, you can see how the thrombus is occluded as it enters the brain. Now, we did one pass here, and this is the second pass. We were only able to open uh, one branch, and you can see this is a thrombus, and the patient did have an infarct. Um, so, but you know, we saved a significant amount of tissue, and this area, the patient had swelling of the brain on the right side, so eventually it required a hemicraniectomy. And then we put the bone back after a few months. So the final infarct was fairly small, and uh, you know, compared to the area that was at risk, and the patient is very functional. He walks with a, with a cane, and he has some hand weakness on the left side. But the uh, patient, this is the, uh, all this, uh, so in 2014, uh, 2015, we had all these trials that came out, which suddenly demonstrated that thrombectomy is a great option for patients with large vessel occlusion. And you can see that here, um, uh, endovascular thrombectomy after large vessel ischemic stroke. This is a, like, um, this is the, from the Hermes collaborators, which is a pool data analysis of these trials. You know, ESCAPE, REVASCAT, MR, Mr. Clean, Extend IA, SWIFT Prime. And you can see that if you just treat 2.6 patients, you can shift the disability significantly compared to the, um, the IV thrombolysis trials. And just by, by treating five patients, you can uh, have patients with functional independence. So obviously this works very well. Now it's also interesting that there are two kinds of patients. There is fast versus slow progressors of infarct growth in large vessel occlusions. The fast progressors are the ones that quickly progress and uh, get a big stroke, whereas the slow progressors progress over a prolonged period of time. So the standard intra-arterial window of six hours is not applicable for these slow progressors. And so this is an example um, of a fast progressor. You see that this is a patient with a large in fact, uh, you can see this is time here, and this is the infarct volume. So this patient progressed quickly to get a fairly large volume. And in this patient, which is on the bottom of the graph, this is a slow progressor. You can see even with this prolonged period of time, at 11 hours, the infarct on DWA MRI is very small. So if you look at the overall scenario, about 25% is a fast progressor. Uh, and the core is more than 70 cc's within six hours, whereas the others fall into the slow progressor group, where the ischemic core volume uh, increases over a prolonged period of time. And so in these patients, you can actually prolong the window of intervention. And um, so there were two trials, the DAWN trial and the DIFFUSE 3 trial which showed benefit from 6 to 24 hours and 6 to 16 hours. So, so now there is a subset of patients who can be helped even at a later time point. So this is a mechanical thrombectomy patient here. Uh, sorry, this is, a, this is a current AHA recommendations. And you can see that the uh, mechanical thrombectomy Recommendations are as follows. Pre-stroke MRS score of zero to one, 
occlusion of the internal carotid artery or MCS segment, which is M1 segment, age greater than 18 years, NIH stroke core of greater than six, um, and aspects of six or greater, and treatment to be initiated within six hours of symptom onset. But in selected patients, you can actually see that the onset within six to 16 hours or six to 24 hours is um, acceptable uh, with certain criteria. If you look at the current state of uh, clinical and procedural results, these are from various registries. You can see most patients present with an NIH stroke score of about 16 to 17. The door to the onset to puncture time is about uh, four hours. And the door to puncture median uh, time is about is a little more than an hour. So there is quite a bit of delay for these patients to get there. And you can see the modified Rankin score of zero to two, which is kind of an independent functional status, is about 55%. Now, what you realize is when you look at this, uh, one in four of the anterior ischemic strokes at least one in four harbor an LVO, but a very large percentage of patients, if you look at all the criteria, 70% of them do not get TPA, even though there is a large vessel occlusion. These are for various reasons. One is, um, you know, it may be multi-vessel occlusion, posterior occlusion, posterior, posterior vessel occlusion. They don't come under the AHA eligible criteria. So there is a need to expand uh, and also get some of these patients in quicker for treatment. So the systems of care are important and there are crucial time points. One is after the first medical contact, is there value in directly sending them to a thrombectomy center? Uh, do interfacility transfers slow them down? Is there value in, uh, more comp in more detailed imaging or can you just do a CT scan? So variables are going to be an important part of the future of stroke detection where you can actually have some kind of a helmet which could help you determine whether there is a stroke or not. So you come to the ER, I'm mean, sorry, when, when the first responder sees you, they can immediately figure out whether you are having a stroke or not. This is an example of a Samsung wearable stroke detecting device. The second is triage decision should be made in the field. Uh, so then you can make a decision as to whether you want to transfer to a comprehensive stroke center or to a primary stroke center. And you could make this transfer based on clinical scales or devices such as, such as a wearable. Now, there has been a trial in Spain, in the Catalonia, Catalan territory of uh, Spain called RACECAD, which looked at the value of directly transferring the patient to a stroke, um, a primary stroke center versus an endovascular center. And there was really no significant difference, but it's hard to extrapolate this uh, because the Catalan territory has a very sophisticated um, medical delivery system. And it is very likely that they have a very efficient way of transferring patients from a primary stroke center to a, to a center where thrombectomy can be done quickly. In the real world, that may not be so. And then the other thing that has really changed is all these AI-enabled applications. Uh, three particularly stand out, RAPID, which, RAPID and VIS AI, which is uh, used extensively in the United States, and Brainomix from the UK. So, these three have enabled us to quickly diagnose large vessel occlusion, the area which is at uh, risk and the area that is infarcted. And they're all uh, enabled through apps. And so you can actually get this information quickly to the people who are involved in providing this care. So then we come to the question of, do we really need a CT perfusion and a CTA? Because if you look at it, four out of 100 patients have list, less disability for every 15 minutes faster we reperfuse after hospital arrival. And uh, 
what is the purpose of all this sophisticated imaging? It's to rule out things. It's mainly to exclude patients from treatment. You want to rule out hemorrhage. You want to rule out absence of occlusion. You want to rule out a large core. You want to rule out absence or small off at risk tissue. How important is it for safety and efficacy and how frequent are patients with large core infarcts? If you really look at large core infarcts, in other words, aspects of zero to five, in LVO patients presenting at zero to six hours, it's about uh, 15 to 16%. So not a large group of patients. And then when you look at the ischemic core volume greater than 70 ml, you find that patients with an ischemic um, core greater than 70 ml, when you revascularize them, the hemorrhage rate is still fairly low. This, in this particular series, it was 0%, but it's not a very high percentage. Uh, so now the next step would be to actually use a regular CT scan to figure out uh, LVO detection. And this is what a company called MeThinks is doing, where they're able to figure out uh, whether there's a large vessel occlusion and the area that's already infarcted just based on a uh, plain CT. Uh, and I think the future would be to go direct to angio without a non-invasive non vessel imaging such as CTA. The cardiologists have already done it. And if you take a patient population of acute stroke within six hours with an NIH stroke score of greater than nine, in order to exclude 15% of patients who may not benefit and are very unlikely to be harmed, we harm the rest of the 85% with the greater than 30 minute delays caused by imaging. So I think in the future, uh, brain imaging is time, and, and that means more neurons are lost. So there has to be a balance. These are some studies which have looked at direct transfer to the angio suite, DAN versus transfer to the AD. And you can see the door to groin puncture time when you go directly uh, to the angio suite is about 24 minutes in this one versus 82 minutes uh, through the ED. And the door to reperfusion time is also substantially shorter when you go directly to the angio suite. Uh, so, you know, the, in the future, what you may do is you'll take the patient to the angio suite, do a quick CT scan on the angio table, and you can see whether there is a hemorrhage. If there is a hemorrhage, you can, uh, you can exclude the patient for thrombectomy. And then you can do the uh, the angiogram and thrombectomy. If you really look at it, at the cost of uh, direct angio suite, direct to angio versus CT and CTP, you can see that if you go to direct angio, the fastest reperfusion, you can save about 15 unnecessary angiograms, but you also save 100 CTA, CTP, and you also have the benefit of patients reperfusing earlier in this 85%. Whereas if you do a CTA and CTP, the 30 minute delay uh, will cause an increased deficit and the health cost of that. You have the additional cost of all the CTA, CTPs, and you save 15 angiograms. So which approach, is saves, which approach saves more money? Um, it's the direct to angio uh, track. And it's also beneficial for the patients. So within a six to 24 hour period, a number is needed to treat of two in dawn. A lack of CTP MRI should not be a deterrent from thrombectomy. I think the combination of neuroprotection with thrombectomy is uh, an important aspect. If you have a reversible model of MC occlusion, um, you can see that, um, sorry, if you, uh, uh, there's an increasing trend to use neuroprotection with thrombectomy. And the most important trial was the ESCAPE NA1 trial, which was the using nerinetide, which is, a, which is a neuroprotectant. 
But unfortunately, this trial did not show a significant benefit between placebo and erinitide. And eventually what we have done is they have looked at uh, what, we, what they realized during this trial was when they used alteplase, which is IV alteplase, uh, there was some interference with the nerinitide. So if you didn't use nerinitide, if, if you did not use uh, alteplase, there was some benefit in that group of patients. So this study is being redone. And then there are questions like, is tenecteprase better? And it looks like it may be marginally better than alteplase. Do we really need to give a thrombolytic agent with thrombectomy? And based on at least these two studies, this is a Chinese study and this is a Japanese study. Those patients who had IV TPA did not substantially benefit when you were planning on a thrombectomy. So this is the data. You can see it's pretty similar. Um, so in conclusion, I think uh, the big things for the future is, uh, do we need sophisticated imaging? Uh, do we need, um, um, is, there, is there a neuroprotectant that you can give along with the thrombectomy to prolong the time window and to save more neurons. And the last uh, bit is to do with the actual technique. There is a shift from using stent reverse to using more of a, a reperfusion catheter, uh, which is faster and uh, more cost effective. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank <music> you.